uh, the virus is widespread in the body and in severe cases can be identified from uh, many body fluids, including uh, blood and uh, urine. Uh, the transmission is mainly by droplets and, uh, and lit also uh, exhaled by an infected person, but also touching on contaminated surfaces and then touching the ear, eyes, nose, and mouth. There are viable viruses on surfaces up to 72 hours, although the uh, amount of virus decreased pretty quickly. These are laboratory experiments under ideal conditions, and the data is published this week uh, in New England Journal. And a big question is how infectious a person is in asymptomatic early phase. Um, the disease as you all probably know, started in the Wuhan in the Hubei in province of China and is now spreading all over the world and classified as a pandemic with now decent control in China and also some evidence that the Korean outbreak is also uh, being under control. These are the European data with viral uh, with uh, COVID-19 documented in all European countries, with Italy, Spain, France, and Germany as being uh, large populations and have many cases. Uh, and this clearly shows that it's no longer China, but the rest of the world that is driving the uh, pandemic. There's a great variability in the symptoms, from no symptoms to fatal ARDS, and the risk factors are high age with associated comorbidities. Pregnant women doesn't seem to be at high risk for severe disease, and the same goes for children. Incubation period five days in median, but with a normal uh, from 2 to 14 days, but occasional cases have been documented outside this incubation period. Uh, this is data kindly provided to me by Simone Cesaro from uh, Verona, showing that up to 6.5% can be asymptomatic, and this is from a more, more like population-based study in a small uh, town in uh, Veneto in Italy and about the same number of uh, or proportion of cases being critically ill. These are the most common symptoms of the disease, where you can have uh, fever alone. We have clearly seen that in a couple of cases uh, diagnosed in Stockholm. Uh, and of course, fever is a symptom that we as transplanters are very aware of because it can be caused by other things, such as sepsis. Uh, so it can clear, it's clear that you can have fever without respiratory symptoms, you can have respiratory symptoms without fever, and basically all combinations thereof. Um, this is the uh, data from China regarding the severity of disease with approximately 20% of infected patients having a severe or critical illness. The case fatality rate has varied between countries. And this, this is most likely depending on how you sample, because there are most likely many might be symptomatic or asymptomatic out there, and making that the overall case fatality rate is likely to decrease over time uh, with more infected patients in the population. We'll find that out when we're able to do serological assessments of patients who have, uh, or populations where we can see which, which have undergone the infection without having uh, a symptom. These are the data from the ECDC as of a couple of hours ago, with almost 250,000 cases worldwide, 100,000 in EU and UK, and 10,000 deaths, of, who, of which about half has occurred in Europe. So this is where um, I started over again. These are data from 
Italy, all, again kindly provided by Simone Cesaro uh, from uh, three days ago. At that time, they had data on 2,000 patients who had died. The figure, unfortunately, now is more than 3,000, and it's clear with a risk in, in, with increasing age, with only five uh, deaths in the cohort below 40, uh, and then rapidly increasing, particularly from uh, 70 and above. So one, what this, that is sort of the pandemic, and of course we have the impact on the society, but what is the impact on stem cell transplant patients in particular? Well, uh, we don't know very much about this until now. We have been discussing in the Infectious Diseases Working Party of the BMT, John Stuszynski and Margusza Panikolska, and also with our US colleagues in the ASTCT, where how we can look at this. And it's clear that we have the risk for the recipient if the recipient develop this infection, and we have to postpone the stem cell transplant, there is a risk by that itself. Then, of course, we have the risk of contracting severe disease. And we know that other respiratory viral infections, such as RSV and influenza, can be more severe in the stem cell transplant population than in the normal population. Uh, and then, of course, the risk for not receiving the stem cell. As the EBMT started very early in the outbreak in Europe uh, registry, and uh, this is, these are figures as of yesterday afternoon, where we have 15 cases known in stem cell transplant patients in Europe, reported to the ID Working Party registry, five from Spain, two from Bel France, two from Belgium, three from Italy, two from Sweden, and one from Greece. This is probably an underestimate because people working very hard, being very busy, is not likely to prioritize reporting in, in a very uh, difficult working situation. But I hope that uh, everybody realizes that this is critical information for us to collect and then to distribute and to be able to help us. The median age of these 15 are 59. Most of them are allos, 10 diagnosed as upper respiratory and five as lower respiratory. At that time of reporting, one out of 15 has died, and more data will collect, be collected. And those of you who have reported cases will receive that at the beginning of next week. We have this ongoing EBMT survey where with the aim to learn more and get the information is distributed out as fast as possible. And uh, we also are in contact with China and the US to get more reports of patients in those countries to get a larger database for us to understand the impact of uh, this infection stem cell transplant. We are also going to collect data on CAR T cell treatment. So, if you have a suspected case, they should be diagnosed according to national guidelines. Uh, if you have symptomatic patients who reside in an area with a high risk, which is most of the major European countries, not the same in all countries, and, may, and also not the same in all regions of all countries. And that, of course, is something that the national authorities know best. Uh, how the situation is in one particular country. Um, it is important to realize that the test and nasal swab for SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus can be false negative and needs to be repeated if there is a strong suspicion. Uh, there has been some figures saying that, for, that uh, up to 15, 20% of tests can be false negative. We need to uh, therefore to repeat it. It's of course also influenza season, so you have to test for other respiratory viral pathogens, influenza and RSV, and preferably by multiplex PCR. But again, that depends on what you have 
available and what are recommended in your country. Uh, if you have an upper respiratory tract sample and there's no respiratory tract symptoms, there should be a chest imaging. Um, the question is if a patient will undergo lavage. Uh, and of course, that Im impacts also on the uh, risk for transmission among healthcare workers. So, if you feel that this is coronavirus and the risk for a co infection is low, you might not need to do it. Um, of course, if you have patients who are not infected, they should restrict the risk of exposure to individuals as much as possible. But with the social isolation uh, now mandated in many countries, this will be sort of an automatic uh, procedure in, in many situations. Uh, they should be careful of hygienic routines, including hand washing and alcohol containing hand sanitizers, not very uh, original, but important. And again, the risk, the way travel has been restricted, this uh, that we refrain from not necessary travel is probably a given in many countries already, but in those countries where this has not yet been um, restricted, it is important to think about. Um, one question is if the transplant program should go on in this situation, and again, this is also a question, what are the resources, how much health resources have to be committed to treat to care for coronavirus patients, but in the pa situations where the program go on because of uh, maybe a very high risk disease, uh, they should be tested before start of conditioning, regardless of the symptoms. Uh, the close contact patients, uh, if we have such patients that are very clear uh, contact, they uh, we, suggest deferral for some time until uh, uh, the incubation time has passed, and they should be closely monitored for the presence of COVID-19. Uh, and in this situation, a candidate has COVID-19, they should be deferred for at least 30 days. Again, taking into account the urgency of the transplant. The last point regarding travel is a little bit it was important in the early phase of the outbreak, but now with all travel restrictions, this is probably not as important any longer. We have also collaborated with WMDA regarding the donor, and uh, we know that uh, both SARS-CoV-1 and 2 and MERS have been detected in blood. The question is, if even if there is a viremia, uh, in an otherwise quite healthy donor, if uh, there is a risk for really transmitting the infection. And we don't know that. You, know, you could argue that receptors for coronavirus is in the airways and whether or not it can get infected by uh, blood or stem cells is currently unknown. And most, however, in my opinion, unlikely. So these are some uh, recommendations from the donor, which donor should be excluded from the nation. Uh, we don't know yet when a previously infected donor can be clear. Uh, there's been some recommendation from the authorities that it should be up to three months. That is a very long time if a patient needs a transplant, and this is something that we need to work on uh, for the next uh, few weeks, uh, particularly, hopefully, when this outbreak is uh, diminishing unknown time from now, uh, and we want to restart the programs, how long we need to wait. Um, um, there are also logistical problems with donations. Uh, of course, the donate donor might become infected in clearance and harvest. The harvest center staff might become infected, making it difficult to perform a harvest. And then with the closed borders, um, 
uh, work within Europe and getting sales from, uh, for example, North America. Uh, it might be difficult. There are many flights rounded, and the options of transferring stem cells are likely to be fewer. Therefore, it's strongly recommended to use prior preserved cells before the start of the condition. Regarding prevention, I think it's now clear with 250,000 cases already in the world that the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus will most likely infect a large proportion. I see the figures of 50, 60, 70, 75 percent. The only question is uh, how long period uh, will have to pass until we have reached sort of an immune status in the population. Uh, it's clearly too late for successful containment, as was obtained for SARS coronavirus 1. And therefore, the aim of preventing the stems of child for the recipient population so that this stage of the pandemic be to avoid infection in the most vulnerable. And those are most likely those early after stems of transplant in patients with Crohn's disease and in those with chronic pulmonary complications. That's that obliterated bronchial life. However, due to lack of data, this is an assumption. Um, hand hygiene, cough etiquette, social isolation, personal protective equipment, cleaning of surfaces, and so on, uh, uh, is uh, important. The last sentence I should have corrected since we got that information I presented a few minutes ago regarding the survival on surfaces, but we still don't know how long it might be infectious from surface. Um, as you are probably aware, intensive work is being conducted in many different places to develop the SARS coronavirus vaccine, and human trials have been initiated early this week. Um, however, even in the best of scenarios, it's likely that we, it will be at least several months before a vaccine can be introduced and widely distributed. Uh, so we are not going to be very helped by a vaccine for the next six, eight, maybe months, maybe longer. IVIG is at least currently unlikely to work for protection since there are no blood donors with specific antibodies, which could provide protection. This is something that uh, when more uh, healthy, otherwise healthy individuals uh, had COVID, uh, this might be something that might become an option, but it is not an option available today. There are information, and I'm sure you have similar in many countries, but these are uh, from the ECDC and can be downloaded and adapted from their website. Okay, so having said that we will see many patients that are infected, we'll have to deal with the infected patient. There's currently no approved drug for the treatment of COVID-19. There are several ongoing trials with different drugs, and some drugs might be available for compassionate use and critically ill patient. Um, these are some more general ideas that uh, with the upper respiratory tract check with the uh, imaging for lower respiratory tract infection. If the imaging is normal and no symptoms, no therapy is recommended at this time. This is not a definite statement. You know, the question is, would you like to treat patients early before they develop low risk of back disease because it might be too late once that has happened. Uh, but uh, we don't know any of the benefit risk scenario. Uh, if you have clinically uh, mild up respiratory symptoms, you could be considered for clinical trials if available, and then very close observation and introducing of agency symptoms progress. In the low respiratory tract infection, the situation is different. 
Uh, there are some uh, suggested definitions by our U.S. colleagues. What's the proven no respiratory tract infection with uh, SARS coronavirus 2? And what is possible? Um, we have the risk for severe lung injury and the development of ARDS. And then, of course, the risk that, as in other viral infections of the respiratory tract, they are complicated by subsequent bacterial co infections with pneumococci, H flu, Staph aureus, for example. There's also possibilities, particularly now in the influenza season, that we might have viral co infections uh, that might be treated. Uh, and uh, we should in patients with low respiratory tract infection, consider therapy, and agents may be added as combination therapy as severity increase. So I'm now going to go through a few of the options that are in development or, uh, where, or where we have some or data. So one is then remdesivir, which is a nucleotide analog that inhibits the polymerase. It's been efficacy demonstrated in vitro and in mouse models of MERS and in vitro models of uh, COVID-19. And there are clinical trials underway. This drug is available in several countries for compassionate use, including Sweden, in particularly patients with more severe disease. Um, such as those requiring mechanical ventilation. There are some uh, key exclusion criteria, liver abnormalities, renal failure, and so on, and the uh, use of other antiviral, experimental antiviral agents. There are some drug interaction, particularly with acetaminophen or paracetamol, which of course is frequently used. Even. So currently, it can be considered in patients requiring mechanical ventilation, but this might change. Um, one other uh, few days ago, interesting option at least was lopinavir ritonavir, which has been used quite a lot in the in the outbreak in several countries. They are protease inhibitors uh, indicated for HIV, and there are some. Uh, uh, data that they have been in non-controlled studies associated with increased survival and lower need of steroids. Uh, it's also been used early in the face of the disease. And, and there are a lot of interactions that we have to be uh, aware of. There came out uh, two days ago a negative report out of China. Uh, when it was used as monotherapy in patients with low risk of contract disease, it played this primary endpoint, which was time to clinical improvement, and also maybe more significant, there was no effect on viral shedding. However, slightly lower number of deaths in the active treatment arm, um, as it was a secondary endpoint in the study. Uh, chloroquine. As you know, it's a malaria drug, and it has, there's quite a lot of in vitro data and animal model data that it uh, can be of uh, value in, uh, in uh, SARS coronavirus 2 infection. There's also some data out of China, uh, and there are re reviews on the topic uh, that has come out the last uh, couple of days. There are clinical trials underway. These drugs have definite side effects, um, GI side effects, bone marrow suppression, renal dysfunction, liver dysfunction, and uh, we, there is an important interaction with drugs, uh, uh, potential prolonging QTC, and we of course use many such drugs in transplant. An interesting option uh, is favipiravir, that is a drug that's been developed for influenza. It's another RNA polymerase inhibitor, and it's been used in different severe virus, viral infections. It's been tested in China and Japan. 
There are so far no formal data presented, but there are media reports uh, suggesting efficacy regarding viral shedding and possibly improvement of patients' pulmonary symptoms. And there is a review of the topic very recently published. There are clinical trials underway. And one good thing with this drug is that there are limited side effects. And rabavirin has been used, as you know, for many years for different infections, including, for example, RSV. Uh, it's a nucleoside inhibitor. Uh, the main indication is hepatitis C, but not a single therapy. And it's been used in several reviews in small series as combination therapy. And at this time, it's difficult to assess any added benefit, but there are clinical trials underway in combination. And those are the antiviral drugs. Uh, then there are the possibility to give supportive therapy for the severe complications. And one such drug is then which you know is one of the most important drugs for use of CAR T cell therapy to uh, treat the cytokine release syndrome. And there is a lot of data supporting that, particularly the severe cases with severe pulmonary injury in ARDS or cytokine mediate. Uh, there are some data from, again, from China. Uh, and it, this drug has been approved in China for use in severe COVID-19 cases. Uh, the problem with TOTSI is, as you probably know, that you will um, block out signs of infection, so there is a risk of secondary infections, particularly septicemias and bacterial infections. So we have to balance the risk benefit of using this drug. The controversial issue is the use of steroids, because, in, as you know, in many viral infections, such as RSV, or influenza, and so on, being on corticosteroids is a negative factor in the transplant or outcome. Uh, on the other hand, it has been used for ARDS. And uh, uh, a little bit depending on how it should be done, it's probably better, uh, in, at least in the data coming out of China, being used as pulses rather than uh, continuous therapy. And um, this is something that needs to be assessed more carefully over time. And it, uh, we could be con steroids could be considered as a part of the pair regimen for patients with ARDS on a case-by-case -case basis. There are many other drugs being tested, JAK1 and JAK2 inhibitors. There are some data from China on missing kind of stem cells in patients with ARDS. Immunoglobulins is a part of the routine management in China. And then from its anti-inflammatory uh, effect, not as a specific drug because there are no antibodies so far in the commercial product, uh, products. There is an antiviral drug, Umifenovir, that is only available in China and Russia, also a flu drug that is used regularly. Uh, in China for patients with uh, COVID-19, and there are other options being tested, single or in combination. So I only can say watch this space for more. So regarding recommendations, uh, we feel that it's difficult to give these recommendations on specific therapies due to limited data and unknown risk benefit very little data on pediatric patients, but clear is that many of these drugs are used quite extensively, chloroquine uh, and uh, other drugs in the regular daily management of non-transplant patients with, with uh, COVID-19. And this field is moving so quickly, so we are most likely to see uh, and more data coming in the next week or two, and then this statement uh, might be changed. 
So with that, I'm done with this presentation and uh, I would like to thank John Skuszynski, Malkoszata Nikolska, Rafa de la Camara, Simone Cesaro, Alpana Wagmer from Seattle and Nicholas Kroger, EBMT president, for helping me uh, preparing this presentation for this webinar. And uh, after that, I'm happy to and try to answer questions, although we have many more questions than answers at this time. Thank you. Uh, patients who were transplanted a year ago and prior considered at risk. Yeah, that's, that, that's a good question. Um, the answer to that is that we don't know. The only experience we have ourselves so far is one patient that was transplanted two and a half years ago with some pulmonary compromise that had uh, fever and nothing else and was discharged yesterday without therapy. Um, and uh, I would say, as we I stated early on in the presentation, that the particular patients with chronic GVHD and pulmonary compromise are probably at risk if a not patient without any immunosuppression, without GVHD doing well, I, I probably wouldn't regard that patient as, as a big risk. What would be our, your first line of treatment in the stem cell transplant patients? Um, I think that the, the most frequently used First line treatment at this time is chloroquine. It's been used. It's been used in patients in Italy. It's been used in patients in Spain. Um, so and it is readily available. Uh, the data on lopinavir just came out uh, two days ago and was negative. I know that has also been used a lot. Uh, and the question is if, if they should be combined. Oh, let's see. What about strategies for screening personnel and transplant candidates? Well, um, I think it's very clear that you should screen transplant candidates. Uh, and um, whether or not, uh, I know some centers definitely screen their staff, others don't. You know, the question is, you have to deal with the staffing situation. What do you do with a coronavirus positive staff person without symptoms or with very minor symptoms? Um, and I think that has to be hospital and country policy. And now many questions coming in at the same time. I'll try to take you know, one by one what the recommendation for patient intended to be to CAR T. I would say probably the same. I know that many. Studies with CAR T are put on hold at this particular time, uh, both for practical and logistical reasons. You have to transfer the product and it has to be produced and be transferred back. Um, if patients are already uh, have their product and they are symptom free, you have to assess it from a risk point of view um, and how. What that and you know what's the risk for waiting? Um, should we test or tolerate stem cell transplant before start of the clinical therapy? Also, I think there is two quest two questions there. One is should you do the autologous transplant at this particular time point? What is the alternative for that patient? But if you bring that patient in, for example, high risk lymphoma planning to do beam, yes, I would test that patient. Uh, do we have any evidence of any relation between the roof and this develop disease development? That's a discussion that has been in the elderly population with uh, particularly cardiovascular risk factors. I only know what the Swedish uh, me uh, medical progress agency said yesterday, namely that we don't have any evidence for that. Uh, but if if the symptoms to be treated are mainly fever, if you want to play safe, you could use paracetamol. 
What do we know of mechanism of pulmonary viral injury viral invasion replication of the inflammatory response? Do we know if repenic patients expect to get less pulmonary injury? That's an interesting point. The answer is that we don't know anything. Uh, we, uh, we hope that we will get the data in, from the EBMT survey so we can find out when the patient was transplanted and if they uh, developed um, uh, more symptoms if they were neutropenic, um, and, but we, we don't know. Uh, oh, there are so many questions now, so I'm sort of losing, losing track of them, actually. Uh, during the presentation, of 15 transplant patients have been infected in which part of the transplantation uh, the COVID had been detected. We are, don't have that data yet. I know about uh, five of them more in detail. Two of them are ours. Three of them come from uh, Madrid. And that was not the early phase, and they have they have been doing pretty well at, at this at this time. Um, any role of prophylactic chloroquine? Not at this time. If you mean that they are not diagnosed with with COVID nineteen. Um, what's your opinion of data on hydroxychloroquine? Well, I don't think that we have any data to say that it would be either better or worse. There's some, some data with one, some data with the other. I would say that both probably are similar, but that is a, a more of a yes or a conjecture from my side. Um, is European centers holding on or to stem cell transfer myeloma? I don't know for Europe. I know what we have decided in the Swedish. Norwegian BMT group and said that we are trying to not doing those transplants at this time because you usually can do other things with these patients and it's not that urgent to do an autologous transplant myeloma. That's what we decided in the Swedish Norwegian group. I don't know what the other large myeloma groups have decided to do. Um, is there knowledge regarding the amount of virus transmitted? I would expect that a higher uh, inoculum is likely to at least cause more rapid infection if it also causes more severe disease. I don't know because it's very difficult to know what, what the inoculum size you are dealing with. You know that you have an exposure, you know you have a close contact, but how have they actually been managing in, uh, and to try to avoid transmission, so I don't have any data for that. Uh, what would be your first line treatment in stem cell transplant patients? I, uh, I know that the first data in many places at this time is chloroquine, um, uh, but this is as of today. Uh, so, already answered a little bit of, uh, on that before. Um, Yeah, I, I question about I question if I have any experience about stem cell transplant recipients. I said that we have 15 patients in Europe so far, uh, mo most of them allos. One out of 15 have died until now, but we will uh, hopefully get more data in the next uh, during the next week or two. Uh, is EBMT considering to recommend to delay stem cell transplant for a specific period of time? I think it, it has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Obviously, if you have a very high-risk disease and the patient is likely not to be able to survive without a transplant for the next two or three months, then at currently at least uh, uh, we would go ahead. If you have a more low-risk disease, uh, benign disease, for example, I wouldn't transplant thalassemias or sickles or or MS or anything like that at this time, maybe not myeloma. So it has to be on a uh, case by case basis. What about pediatric patients? No data. We, none of the 15 reported in uh, the EBMT registry so far is pediatric. The youngest is 20. Uh, so we have no reports, so we have no data. Um, 
how likely is the transmission of virus from a non-symptomatic person? Yeah, that's a very tricky one. There are some, there's been some reports of so-called super spreaders, and there is some data from Korea where individuals seem to spread more likely. Um, I would, as a general philosophy, say that mildly symptomatic patients or asymptomatic individuals might probably have less virus, but that's a guess from my side. Of course, they are not coughing, they are not sneezing if they have, don't have any symptoms. So that might also make them slightly less likely to, uh, to um, transmit, but this is for the epidemiologists more than for me. Uh, what do my asymptomatic children? Uh, should be tested before conditioning? Well, we do. But we, we test all, all patients coming in with respiratory viruses anyhow, both adults and children. And of course, now we have added coronavirus to that testing. Um, yeah, but there, there are conjunctivitis. Uh, the first patient presented with conjunctivitis. We don't hear about that. Well, we know that virus can be present in conjunctiva. So it is a part of the of the symptom complex. Um, an individual tested positive recovered. Is there a risk for infected the second time? That's a very good question. Um, uh, we know that there will be specific antibodies and they are now coming out. The, the, um, uh, both IgM and ATG responses. I would expect from what we know about uh, upper respiratory viral infections in general, that it might not be a lifelong immunity. As you know, you can be infected several times with influenza. You can be infected several times with um, RSV. RSV even without the virus really molecular developing. And um, so, if and of course, if this virus behaving like influenza, they might avoid the immune system. So it is, it is, I would say it might be possible. I would think it will not be a short-term uh, problem, but in a couple of years, you might see the infect. Uh, screening personnel and transplant candidates, I will answer that, I think. General question about the RNA vaccine to the uh, what the readout to assess viral load, I don't really know because we have to look at this and I think there's very little data to, 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 for me to answer that question. Regarding treatment of CAR T, yeah, I will answer that one. Uh, viral load and what is the follow up period so far? I, I don't. Quite understand the question. Uh, you, you know, you can do semi quantitation of viral load in from respiratory secretions. That's been done for flu, that's been done for RSV and other uh, viruses. I haven't seen any data uh, so far with uh, COVID 19, uh, but it should be able to be done. Uh, I don't quite get the problem, the, the question about the follow up period so far. We know from the stem cell transplants, the follow up period is, is very short. Uh, uh, and, um, but, uh, and at least the ones in, in Europe, we are trying to get more data out of China, but so far we haven't got it. All of this I've answered to, Ruf now answered. Here. Uh, a lot, so many so many questions. I'm trying to, and unfortunately, jumping on the screen on the screen all the time. So uh, difficult to uh, do change change your medication recommendations for pediatric patients. Not at not at this time, but there are very little data to support that. Um, the blood donation, if it's safe from healthy donors, yeah, that's what, among others, the European uh, Commission and the European uh, authorities with Council of Europe is looking at. 
if there should be any quarantine on blood products. There, there is no answer to that question. My personal guess is a blood donor that is healthy and you don't, your blood donor will don't, not donate blood if they have 39 degrees of fever. Uh, so a healthy blood donor is, is unlikely to have substantial viremia, but that is conjecture, not knowledge. Um, hydrochloroquine and azithromycin. Yeah, azithromycin is an interesting drug, as we, as we know, for uh, uh, inflammatory responses in the lung, both with lung transplants and stem cell transplants. I think that's an, that's an interesting thing that definitely, that definitely should be tested. Uh, Cancelling deferring categories of stem cell transplant. I answer that. Uh, do we need COVID-19 screening of blood products? I doubt it, but we'll see what the uh, blood bank regulators come up with. Um, do we have any information reports of, of the load of viral particles for exposure? Yeah, I've answered that already as far as and I would I would expect I would expect that the low the higher viral load in respiratory situations, the more likely that is to be transmitted, but there are no, to my knowledge, no hard data. At your center, are you using hydrochloroquine for upper respiratory tract disease? Uh, no, we are not yet. We are discussing when, where to intervene, but we are currently not giving it to mildly symptomatic upper respiratory patients. I know other centers with more experience is doing different. But this is what, what we are doing. Uh, when would the next uh, webinar be exported to EBT Web? I cannot answer that question, but hopefully uh, there will be an announcement on the web um, after this lecture. Uh, what about donor lymphocyte infusion? I don't think it's a big issue. I would, if, if you want to bring, if you need to bring the patient in for donor lymphocyte infusion, um, I, I would do it. Are there any tests to detect virus in blood samples? I would discuss that. Automyeloma, I would discuss that. Uh, blood product, duration of virus shedding in patients who result COVID-19. Um, I think there is from the Chinese data, but I didn't look it up. So I cannot, but the data should be out there. Ibuprofen, I talked about. Uh, um, I don't know. I only know it is in the Chinese recommendations. They have published a management handbook in China, and umfenovir is one of the drugs they mention. Of course, it's not available in, in the EU. So if you say it doesn't work, in, because you're sitting in Russia and have experience for that drug, I think that's an interesting information, uh, recommendation monitoring in urine, stools, or blood. No, there are no recommendations, and I don't think there would be need for it. Combination of, yeah, either, uh, either, uh, either, uh, either chloroquine and isomycin, I wouldn't discuss that. So the staff in the MTB unit is screened routinely and several times. That's a political question. Uh, and, this, and it has to be defined by your uh, authorities in the disease control and, and in Sweden. The answer is that we don't, which is what we are guessing. We would like to do it, at least to know where we are, but so far we are not allowed to do it. Uh, pediatric donors, be tested. I, I would test, uh, you know, uh, we need this knowledge, so to, to, to test patients and donors would make perfect sense, sense to me. Uh, how levels of IgG against COVID in blood for the very sick patient survival? Um, and, you know, the problem is uh, there's no data, there's no levels of COVID antibodies against COVID-19 with the exception of now the convalescent patients, and they are mainly so far in China, 
uh, although there are now uh, increasing numbers being cleared of the infection. Italy, um, this is a very important area for study. Uh, and what we do now with the, uh, when the immunoglobulin companies start to produce with more uh, lots coming from patients having had COVID, but we don't have the data. Um, is, then, is that one death related to COVID-19 or another cause? The answer is, I don't know. That's it. I assume that's the 15 EBMT cases, and we are collecting that data, but we don't have it. As donors before the nation, I would recommend it. Um, thank you very much for uh, attending this webinar, and I'm happy to uh, that so many has listened and the big interest in this topic and i'm sure that we will come back with another web webinar at a later time thank you